This up here is Iceland. And yes, there is snow and ice here, but I think we can all agree that the real Iceland is Greenland. I think the people here have a sense of humour. They do also enjoy their myths and half-truths. Maybe it was called Iceland to confuse would-be invaders into travelling onto Greenland instead. Maybe it's called Iceland because an early explorer hated it so much that they called it that out of spite. I've heard both stories mentioned by guides on the island. They also go on about elves, trolls and hidden people, but given how they literally build and maintain dozens of huts for them to live in, it's difficult to tell where the jokes end. So yeah, this is Iceland. And yes, there is an Iceland in Iceland. It's a miracle that a name as easy as Iceland was chosen for the country, because the Icelandic language is one where none of its words are pronounceable. Pronounceable. Just zoom into any part of the country and attempt any pronunciation like your life depends on it. You won't manage it. And I guess it isn't just me, because all of the guides introduce themselves all like, Hi, my name is Ingolfula Ingolfula But you can call me Tim. And of course everybody opts for the easier name. And I see the pity in that. I look at their unique culture and traditions, and at how they must be continually being eroded away by external influences. Aside from during Covid, tourism to the island has grown almost every year, and now over 2 million people visit the country with a population of fewer than 400,000 which has caused everywhere to be signposted in English as well as in Icelandic. But don't worry, tour guides get their revenge by forcing everybody in the group to try and pronounce the names of places. It's how they get their kicks. You might ask what I was doing in Iceland. You might think of me as being a computer game obsessed YouTuber, but I'll surprise you by saying that I do like to escape from all that to places on holiday. And Iceland is the perfect place to escape from the virtual world. It's an island that's pretty much Death Stranding. Yes, it has lots of mountains and volcanoes dotted about, but it's dominated by this thing here. Just look at it, it's massive. This is a national park. It isn't just home to the highest peaks on the island, but also to the largest glacier in Europe. And while this thing is immensely tall, its width is even more impressive. It stretches on for miles and miles. It's a whole mountain range, caked in ice. And its volcano seems to go off every 300 years or so in dramatic fashion. But don't worry, it's been ages since it lasted that. About 300 years in fact. I will be covering my trip to this thing in another video, which you really should check out because it's even more amazing than you might expect. Everywhere we went, the dangers were pretty well explained, so if you're sensible enough then you should be okay. But this still wasn't enough to stop some people from taking risks. Namely on the beaches, where I swear some people think that waves are big friendly things coming for a hug. They're not. Don't try to stroke them. Please. And in case you somehow hadn't figured it out from all the talk of volcanoes already, Iceland is an active volcanic island. If you get too close to an active volcano, you'll even get a text message informing you about the risks. These are probably a bit less dangerous than the waves though, since many hikes take place going up them, and we even slept at the foot of one of them. The Icelandic volcano you'll most likely have heard of is this one here, which in 2010 threw ash across most of Europe, managing to ground flights across the continent for nearly a week. But probably the worst eruption in human times was when Larki went off about 250 years ago, which murdered half of Iceland's livestock, resulting in famine which caused the death of a quarter of the island's population. And it shrouded Europe in thick, poisoning sulphur dioxide, which killed an estimated 23,000 people in England alone. It's ridiculous how much Iceland has influenced Europe in the past. And despite that, we all still forget to draw it on the world map. It's also a great place to see the Northern Lights from. If you're going to Iceland, then I suggest you keep an eye on this site, which tracks how powerful the lights are. What you're looking for here is fluctuations. Lots of wavy lines equals more chance of seeing northern lights. These things can happen at any time, but you won't see them in the day because it's too bright. Apparently though, even if you're in the capital city, you just have to walk to the waterfront and you'll see them clearly if they're there. Which unfortunately I didn't know about on my holiday until it was too late. The cameras on mobile phones happen to be very good at picking up colours, so if you see a cloud that looks rather sus, simply long expose a picture of it and if it's green then congratulations, you've spotted the northern lights. So although they're northern lights, Iceland is so far north that it can get them directly above itself, or even to the south. The more powerful the lights are, the further south they tend to travel. So our guide was joking that they see a lot of the common green colour, but not so much of the more exotic and restless appearing purple type. Whenever they're that powerful, they often shift too far south to be seen from the country. Two thirds of the country's 370,000 strong population live here in Reykjavik, and they have a problem with incest. Everybody on the island is related to each other to some extent. Luckily, they have family tree records dating back over a thousand years, which they can access within a matter of seconds online. So imagine this, you're on a night out and for once you actually get lucky and find a person who isn't instantly repulsed by you and your endless knowledge of Doctor Who monsters. But before you take them home, you have to check that they aren't your sister. Or brother. 
Speaking of problems getting wood, there are very few trees in Iceland. There's a joke that if you ever get lost in a forest in this country then all you have to do is to stand up. But this meant that they had to build their early houses out of rocks and dirt, and these sucked, they were cold and damp and didn't smell too great. They eventually imported timber, but with Iceland being the third windiest place in the world and one of the wettest, wood here doesn't last very long. So to protect timber houses they coat them in corrugated metal, preferably painted bright and beautiful colours to battle against the seasonal affective disorder that they suffer from during the winter and its torturously long nights. Coming from England, stuff in Iceland is rather expensive. One pound was about 170 Icelandic kroner when we visited, which made converting prices really difficult. You divide it by two and then, most importantly, add a bit to that. According to this chart, they claim that an inexpensive meal is about 2,500 kroner, which works out at about 14 pounds, but we managed to find places in the capital that served 1,800 kroner pizzas and a 1,500 kroner burger and fries. So if you know where to look, it isn't too expensive, but for most of our meals we lived off Ritz crackers and biscuit bars bought from supermarkets, which at 250 and 80 kroner respectively are some of the least expensive commodities in the country. But there are also perks to this place. They have infinite hot water and extremely cheap electricity, and they don't let it go to waste. Well actually they do waste a lot of it, but in cool ways. And by cool, I mean hot. The hot water used in showers and heating homes comes straight from geothermal activity going on beneath the island. That's infinite hot water right there. If you live in Iceland and your house gets too hot, then you don't turn the heating down, you simply open a window, just like everybody would in my old house. Look at all these windows, all open when the temperature's below freezing. Mental. They have so much hot water at their disposal that they run pipes beneath the central streets to keep them from icing up, and if you have a shower in Iceland, it will smell of eggs from all the sulphur that comes out of the ground with the water. Now I know that a lot of people dislike the smell, but I personally enjoy taking hot showers while engulfed in the warm smell of rotten eggs. They say that the cold water in Iceland is the purest in the world, so there's no need to buy bottled water. But whatever you do, don't drink the hot stuff. As for the cheap electricity, apparently a few aluminium smelting factories consume the majority of the power on the island, so they pay so much towards the island's electricity bill that it's made extremely cheap for everybody else. And it all comes mostly from renewable sources. In the past, the country was reliant on funding from Denmark, and then from America for a while after World War II in exchange for housing a military base there. But now they're self-sufficient, and are making great use of their natural resources. To make the most of their infinite warm water, Iceland has many heated outdoor pools. You have the touristy ones like Blue Lagoon, which are a unique experience to visit. Oh, well now I've got two. Yeah. And then I've got none. These are the only ones that tourists really hear about. The water in these places is cloudy from all the minerals that come from underground, and the pools are surrounded by volcanic rocks and stuff. Lots of people bravely bring their phones to the lagoon with them and spend their whole time awkwardly keeping it above water while taking lots of risky selfie snaps. There's also a place that gives you facial masks and alcoholic drinks, maximum of three per wristband, and, you know, it's that kind of place. And it's quite expensive. But hidden away around the main city are the public baths, which is where the locals hang out. For obvious reasons I couldn't film there, so here are some pictures of the place instead. The one we visited was the oldest and looked worn and dated, but don't be fooled, for it's friendly, it's popular and it's well maintained. And best of all, it's very cheap. For an adult ticket it's 1100 kroner, which works out about £6.50, and for that you can stay for as long as you like. There was the usual indoor swimming pool, but the most popular ones were outdoors, which sounds strange when you're in a country that's further north than most people living in Canada are. But these outdoor pools are actually the greatest thing ever. You have some pools heated to 37 and 38 degrees, which is where most people hang out and socialise. These are pleasant enough to sit in for a while, provided you occasionally take your arms out of the water to try and help you to cool off. But they also have 42 degree hot tubs, which were almost painfully hot. If you're like me and haven't had a bath in decades, let me remind you of what this is like. You can't cool down while submerged in the water. You start cooking. You know you're sweating, but it doesn't do anything because you're already underwater. I couldn't stay in these tubs for more than a few minutes, and they were too hot even for my girlfriend, and she sets the shower back home to the temperature of the sun. So this leads to a bizarre situation where, when you first get to these pools, you have to make a mad freezing cold dash to one of the hot tubs. And it's great when you finally get in them. But after you've been in them for a while, you become a radiator and can walk about naked in the freezing cold for several minutes before even beginning to get cold. Even after I had left the place, my face remained beetroot red for about half an hour. So these outdoor hot tubs in Iceland are great, and seem to be what their social life revolves around. But they do have the potential to be dangerous. So why are these things so cheap? I suspect this is done because otherwise everybody in Iceland wouldn't have much else to do, and would be miserable and lonely and would remain indoors all the time. But secondly, because the country suffered from a number of horrendous shipwrecks where ships would crash just before reaching shore, and people would see their loved ones drowning just off the coast because they didn't know how to swim. 
so the government eventually pushed for compulsory weekly swimming sessions for children and lets everybody else visit as well because why not? This has resulted in Iceland having the greatest, cheapest and most social public baths that I've ever been to, and they're all government run. Imagine how great they would be if they were privatised. So that's my summary of Iceland. Once I've got around to making them, you'll be able to check out my other videos of the island, which will contain lots of pretty footage. We were only there for four days, so we did the two most popular tourist trails, being the Golden Circle and the South Coast one. I'll be making a video on each.